Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Established in 2017, Goodman's creates sustainable investment solutions for advice professionals and retail customers, focusing on tools that help customers engage with sustainable and responsible investing. The goal is to play a key role in redirecting capital to environmentally sustainable, socially responsible, and ethical business. The Goodman's Advisor Portal is a discovery, analytics, research, and advice support tool designed to give advisors the confidence to determine their clients' responsible investment needs, analyze portfolio holdings, and access institutional-grade environmental, social, and governance research for over 7,000 global equities, ETFs, and funds. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Strike a light. Clayton here from XY Advisor. Uh, today, I've got a pretty cool guest. It's Tom from Goodman's. Um, Tom, you, you like we were chatting, and I found. Well, first of all, your story is interesting because you used to be an advisor, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's yeah. always. I love framing those conversations as, "Well, you know what it means when when okay." So the audience is financial planners, and you used to be one, so you get it. Um, and then I'm interested in sort of a, on a personal level, ethical investments. So we've you know we we sort of met a couple of years ago, um, and of chatted over time about you know uh how ethical investments are becoming more and more important and then uh you know i decided i wanted to do this five-part ethical series you put your hand up said actually we'll sponsor and i was like that's cool um but you've also got some advisor-led stuff and we'll, we'll we'll get to that at the end um but mate thanks for coming on Thanks for having me. It's uh, yeah, great to be here, and I'm, I'm pretty excited to be able to get to talk to you know a whole bunch of like the advisors in your community who yeah. potentially you know the most progressive advisors in the country, which is which yeah. is amazing for us, particularly on you know the topic that we're talking about with ethical and responsible investing. You know, it's it's a new wave, and it's going to take a new wave of advisors to really start championing it. So yeah, that's a really good point. Um, X Y really like yeah so. The average age of the XY advisor is 42 years old, so it's probably more X than it is Y. Um, but it's always been, I guess, thought about as a, and this is like a, a pretty dorky word, but um, psychographic. Ooh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like a, you know, like a mindset. Um, it's always weird to say that word because I don't actually use it in day to day conversation. <laughs> Um, but mate, so you like, this is actually my first podcast in this, uh, studio at our new house in, in well, our new home in customs house. So it's awesome to have you here, but I want to go through some of the things that I've learned on this journey that I've been chatting about in regards to, uh, ethical investments. And, uh, and I would love to hear sort of your overlay of where you think everything's headed. Yeah. Fantastic. So from what I can tell. Uh, ethical investments is sort of a trend that uh, I guess broader society is uh, reflecting. So we care now, you know, if if the the eggs are caged or not, right? Now, not everyone cares, but there is there's enough people that care that so when you go get your eggs, it says caged or non caged, um, and so. Funnily enough, I actually found that to be probably the best question to ask. Going through this process, yeah. it was like, you, you want to talk about ethical investments, but you don't want to distract your client as an, as an advisor from your client's well-being and future sort of growth as a human. Hmm. Um, but I found just asking the question, hey, like, would you like your eggs caged or uncaged or does that matter to you? I, I thought was a really cool sort of entry level question where if someone goes, no, you know, like it, it doesn't bother me, then well, you don't really need to bring up the topic. Um, but in your opinion, what would you say is uh, the main driver for what we are clearly seeing as an increase in this ethical investment space? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a huge question um, to, 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 I guess, to try and answer in a really concise way. But I think where you're heading is probably the really, really 
critical and focal point. You know, this is actually being led from a consumer perspective. And it's it's a consumer concern that has been kind of around, you know, shopping, you know, caged eggs, you know, more recently, particularly in this country around, you know, the keep cup generation, you know, mm. how do you buy your coffee? You want your organic, sustainable coffee. And, you know, the, the conscious coffee drinkers now get it in their, their coffee cup. You know, it's really simple things that have kind of been in the kind of the retail shopping land and now really, really starting to permeate and impact multiple decisions, you know, including all the financial decisions that a household makes. And that now really includes how money is managed and how it's invested and what those decisions are and what the impact of sustainability and ethics has for each individual on those decisions. And, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is completely universal. Um, the really interesting thing that we've found through our customers and our research around ethical and sustainable investing is that it's very, very personal mm. and there cannot be any judgment. You know, so going back to what you're saying about the eggs, you know, some people might go, absolutely, I want organic, completely uh, free ranged, uncaged. That is my minimum standard. I will not deviate from that. If the shop doesn't have it, I'm not buying. Yeah. Others might go, oh, I'd prefer it. If they don't have it, I'm just going to go organic. And that's fine too. And then others will go, quite frankly, I don't really care. I just want the cheapest. Totally. Um, yeah. You know, best price, best, best you know, what, whatever factor is that I determine to make that decision on. Um, and all those things are different. They're all different across every single kind of facet of sustainable and responsible investing and decision making. You know, so that means that, you know, a younger a younger man might have a very very different opinion about what sustainability means to an older man. Same with a younger woman versus an older woman. Same mm -hmm. with men versus women. We even see differences across the states um, with our retail customers. You know, people in Victoria care about very different things from people in New South Wales. Um, it's a really, really interesting kind of piece around how the consumer sees sustainability. And I think that's, that's the important bit for advisors to really understand is that although there are an increasing number of products out there, unfortunately, products don't fit everyone. Yeah. Um, and it's getting your head around that, I think, which is the kind of the next evolution, next phase, and that real kind of discovery process that advisors need to go through, which is the really exciting bit for us. Man, can we go through some of these things in the states? Yeah. So, so like, what's what's something interesting uh, that advisors in Melbourne should be aware of their potential clients care about? So, in you know, to put it in really pretty broad yeah. strokes, yeah. what we actually see from um, Victoria, and particularly Melbourne, so yep. like a very much more kind of classical big city versus, say, Sydney, which is much more of a coastal city, much more laid back. Yes. We see two really big differences. Within the kind of city scope, um, we actually see much, much more concern around equality and diversity issues, I guess because there's probably a much more of a melting pot within, within a city. So that concept and that problem is much more ingrained in people and how they live their lives. Yes. Um, now, not to say that Victorians don't care about the environment or anything like that. We just see a slight swing to say, actually, societal issues probably creep much higher in oh. Victoria than in New South Wales, where yeah. actually, possibly because, you know, it's a beach city, yeah. we care much, much more about the environment oh, um, than we do about so the other things. And, you know, they're just little things that kind of break down. And when that yeah. comes into, you know, what does that mean from an investment perspective, that actually has an influence on, on you know, the companies, the funds, the yeah. ETFs that you yeah, might yeah, look yeah. at for that customer. That's so interesting. I am 100% uh, a product of my environment. And then I'm much more interested in environmental issues than I am in societal issues. That yeah. is, yeah, that's super interesting. Okay, cool. And and uh, and let me guess, um, anyone in Queensland just doesn't care about anything? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Come on. No, look, we've lived under their foot in terms of origin for uh, nine of the last 11 years. Mm -hmm. I like to... You know, <laughs> jab back. one in whenever I can. <laughs> um, oh man, that's super interesting, actually. So, uh, so I want to touch on something that's really interesting because, yeah, as I've gone through this um, process of, the, of, I guess, discovering, you know, really sort of, I wouldn't say like a purely beginner level, but certainly I didn't know a lot of stuff, and now this is sort of the last part of the five part series. Um, and so I now understand that this has been going on for a long time. It's very global in nature. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, tools and resources 
um, to help people make these decisions and things like that. And so we've got sort of this uh, movement from, you could call it the industry itself, the ethical mm -hmm. industry or, or, you know, and then you've got this uh, other lever that we've just spoken about, which is um, the clients and, and people and, and their interest in this topic as well. So what I found really interesting and is going to piss off a lot of advisors, by the way, but um, is the fact that in the fascia uh, standards that hidden in there is uh, you need to know what your clients think about ethical investments. Mm -hmm. Now that, uh, like that's a, that's a huge one because this now that becomes a part of your due diligence process as an advisor um, and now takes it from a, like a theoretical, hey, this would be cool to get my head around someday to, well, now you have to, right? Mm. Um, and obviously that means different things for different advisors, but uh, I would like to sort of um, go over with you what that means you know to as far as you're aware obviously you're sure. not a fascia expert but i'm sure you've sort <laughs> of got some idea so maybe you can give a little bit of insight into uh into you know what what those conversations are going to look like um but kind of where i want to end up is the practical stuff right so like how to bring up the conversation mm -hmm. with your clients in a as an advisor, which yep. you're aware of. Um, now, I've, I sort of said, hey, how do you feel about caged eggs? You said, that's a good one. Also, what about a keep cup? And I'm I, I think that's probably even a better, <laughs> better one, <laughs> to be honest. I think asking you about, um, you know, if someone likes to reuse a coffee cup is probably even an easier way to broach the subject. Because I, I think it, like, I've kind of gone through the journey of like, imagine if I was the client and an advisor asked me a pretty hectic question, like, "Hey, how do you feel about child slave labor or whatever?" Right? Absolutely. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be a little bit like, "Whoa, bro!" Like, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I'm here to talk about how I'm going to put my kids through college. I'm not here to talk about solving the world problems. Yeah. And also, now, are you going to judge me, hmm. right? Because I haven't said, "Oh my God, I care about X, Y, Z so much." So these are real sort of, uh, I think, pertinent uh, strategies that a, an advisor now needs to equip themselves with in order to tick off this fascia box. So if, if nothing else, let's make sure that advisors can walk away from this podcast knowing how to tick off that fascia box in the easiest, most um, you know, friendly way possible. So sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a massive one. And, and with all kind of regulatory kind of change and influence, it's quite an evolutionary process. So, you know, although this kind of directive is coming down, you must understand this from your customer. What that actually means is still, you know, yet to be really, really clearly defined. And so actually the way that I look at this and, you know, I'm putting my advisor hat back on now rather than my Goodman's hat yeah. is I look at this and go, wow, this is a fantastic opportunity. This is a brand new conversation that I can have with my client that has never been had before by me or my client that sets me apart and puts me at the kind of forefront of what the future of advice could be and what, what the real values and interests of those, those customers are. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, to, to your point, Clayton, that you just said, it, it might be that you'll ask the question and the client will go, look, I'm not interested. Move on. That's fine. But my suspicion, backed by some pretty significant research in the market, is that 90% of your customers will go, yes, I do have an opinion. Yeah, right. And I think that's a really, really important thing is to not shy away from this and look at it as a tick box exercise. And, you know, so the really minimum standard, the tick box could be simple question. Clayton, do you care about socially responsible investing? Yes or no? If you say no, tick, move on. That's the real base level. Mm. But I think as we've just described, there are so many facets to that. You know, it's like, how do you feel about environmental issues? How do you feel about social issues? How do you feel about the quality of governance of the companies that we're investing in and their impact on the world? You know, those are very, very far reaching conversations to have with a customer. And I think that's, that's the opportunity and the challenge. Um, the challenge is 
how do advisors now frame up and open up this potentially broad conversation with a customer included in their advice process and have a really kind of accurate and consistent way of understanding and measuring what the client's telling them. Importantly, from an advisor's perspective, once they've been told, they then need to include that in their advice process. And that's another really big step. You know, so we've gone from it being a little tick box from Fancier saying, yep, you have to yeah. ask this question to yeah. going, well, if I get an answer, yeah. what does that answer mean? Yeah. How do I bring that answer into my advice process? Yes. And how do I show that I'm giving suitable advice yep. um, and that I, I include the outcomes in the compliance process? And so now we're going, right, this is a real opportunity to have a really great conversation with a customer, mm -hmm. um, potentially find brand new outcomes for that customer, which they've never thought of before, or think about how we manage their wealth and construct their investments in a brand new way. Mm -hmm. um, but then also build this into our existing processes. And that's really where kind of Goodman's and the Goodman's Advisor Portal comes in. It's really designed to, to fit those three things. And one is support that discovery process, Two is to support that um, research process. And then lastly is to support that advice process. So really? It's, 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 go into that first bit. So what do, you, what do you do to help an advisor tick that first box? So the way the, the Goodman's Advisor Portal works is that it, it, it gives a tool over to the advisor to use with their customers to, to get that consistent and accurate measurement of what a customer's sustainable views are. Right, um, and so it's it's an online digital um, questionnaire, if you will, but right. you know it's very interactive, um, which is basically allowing the customer to um, illustrate and inform the advisor on what are the things they care about when it comes to sustainability and ethics. You know, so some of those questions we've yep. asked, you know, is it yep. environmental? Yep. Is it social? Yes. Um, it helps through some machine learning to prioritize what those things are for that individual customer so the advisor can really start to elevate and pull out what the really important things mean for that customer. And then lastly, it has the kind of more traditional stuff, you know, so what do you absolutely not accept? You know, is it gambling? Yeah. Is it slavery? Is it yeah. fossil fuels? Is yeah. it predatory lending? Is it yeah. GM crops? Um, you know, there's predatory a predatory lending. Point. That's mm. a big one. Huge, like, huge, and increasingly popular. Oh my selection. God! Mm. A bunch of um, startups, and I'm not going to name names, but like, yeah. That uh, I mean, someone asked me the other day, like, uh, I think it was even last night. I said I'm in, you know, essentially in fintech mm. for the last few years, and uh, they said, um, "What do you think about you know this this company?" And I said, "Well, you know, helping." someone spend more money when they're not entirely sure that they can mm -hmm. i mean like why wouldn't i just start a gambling company absolutely right. <laughs> you know what i mean like i obviously all i care about is creating a company that produces good bottom line profit which annoys me mm. it does annoy me because absolutely. because like this this person who is sitting across the table from me is actually my cousin's 40th right so you always meet weird people at, at family <laughs> bloody you know gatherings um so i'd never seen him before and, and he goes you know business is about m m selling to dumb people and i was like oh, <laughs> i just went i like drop that bomb normally <laughs> yeah like normally i i mean i was probably like three or four beers in so i was like no i just i can't agree to that i i just why can't why can't business be designed to make the world a better place? And I know that sounds silly, but there are ways to achieve it these days. And um, yeah, I'd love to be able to scope predatory sort of lending, which I mean, I, I feel like should be something close to advisors' hearts in general, right? Is like it, what products are out there screwing up people's financial lives? Absolutely. I mean, it's everything that you know really great advisors stand absolutely against. Yeah, it's about being. You know, financially savvy and in control and making really good decisions and, you know, predatory lending and those types of products and those types of providers go absolutely against that very principle. So even that in itself is such an interesting connection between advisor head and advisor world and customer world. Mm. Um, and, you know, when I, when I say something like predatory lending is getting much, much more popular. Um, so Goodman's has a, a, an investment app which is designed for retail customers. So it's a share trading app based around sustainability and ethics. Um, predatory lending 
since the Royal Commission, has kind of starting to rise to the top of the number one screens. Is that right? Absolutely. You know, as, as awareness is being lifted in, you know, the community and the consumer world, this yeah. is a topic which people care about. Oh, man, that's so cool. Absolutely. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much going on. I mean, just, just to touch on some of the points from, you know, from your, your cousin's 40th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad I wasn't there, and I, and I hadn't had too many beers. <laughs> um, but you know, even that world is changing. You know, they, they, I'm sure most most listeners will have seen the news. It was probably you know six to eight weeks ago now of the the business roundtable in the U.S. where the most senior leaders from um, the largest company in companies in the U.S. got together and basically said that shareholder value is no longer the primary objective of a business. What? It's incredible, isn't it? You know, I didn't so hear about it, it hasn't changed from you know. There's been no legal structure change yes. in what a company's priority has to be. Yeah. But the top CEOs in the country, you know, from all the way to you know the the Tim Cooks of Apple to Bezos of Amazon, etc., are now saying that you need to factor in sustainability, environmental impact, and those considerations into how you run your business. It is not just about profit and continued growth. Okay, so a couple of things there. I'm pretty sure it's written into law that you have to make shareholders your top priority. So what they're saying is that that doesn't necessarily go away, but it now has to be considered in the broader aspect, and partly because environmental issues are gonna lead to less profit. Mm. Um, you're putting yourself at risk. A part of like, the the the, um, the skeptical part of me says, "Oh, you're just trying to make it more difficult for competitors." You know, like now that the profit's been made, mm. um, you know that's just my uh, possibly or yeah, so, yeah, some, yeah. something like Apple. You know, now there's a fantastic opportunity for them to use their hordes of cash um, to start Literally. putting it into, you know, supportive projects that support the community or products that are more socially conscious and supply chain processes that are more socially conscious. Yeah. You know, take the lead from companies like Patagonia, for example, although it's not a listed company. You know, what a fantastic example of how a business can be run for profit and for purpose. Yeah. And, you know, and I think that's really what these CEOs are starting to recognize is they're going, there is now a way. Um, and, you know, whether it is just through a greater level of awareness or if it's being led by technology and sophistication and systems, everyone is now looking at this and going, there is an opportunity here for us to make money and do good. And yeah. that's starting to permeate down. And, you know, there's, there's many of them out there, you know, the... Um, you know, Larry Fink from BlackRock, you know, massive, massive supporter of sustainable investing to the point where it's now influencing how BlackRock itself is run as a company and the investments that they curate. Wow. Um, and, you know, so this is now permeating, you know, from business leaders into companies and it's being recognized. So you've yeah. got companies, you've got regulations, you've got consumers um, creating this huge need and this huge level of interest. Um, and now, you know, I, I see it, you know, obviously I have a real passion for this space. Yeah. Um, you know, I see it as this next opportunity for advisors to come in and go, well, I now need to respond to, to what my customers want. Um, not all of them, but most of them. Yeah. I've uh, lived by this sort of uh, mantra, this concept of being a missionary and a mercenary, the concept of, uh, of uh, making money and making a difference for a while now, just on that, on that, on a sort of like personal level. And um, yeah, that I've, I'm definitely a fan of using capitalism to make the world a better place. I, I, I think that entrepreneurs are actually the, the, the best resource the world has to make the world a better place. Like I, I feel like, you know, using, you know, ingenuity and, and, you know, like the wisdom of the crowds, so to speak, you know, getting people to care about this sort of stuff. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see, uh, you know, for example, like, I'll call these companies out because these are massive ones, but something like a Nike, right? Where they put all this marketing out. Now, everyone knows marketing is a market, uh, sorry, Nike is a marketing company, not a manufacturing company. But um, they put all this marketing out to say they stand for all this social justice stuff. But, I mean, dude, <laughs> you've got like slave labor yeah, absolutely. creating your shoes. Absolutely. So, I that that just drives me nuts. So 
please tell me there's a screen that, that people care about. Please. Uh, absolutely. So, so, okay, I mean, that's a really, really good example. Yeah. So on the positive side of things, you know, all the stuff that Nike did last year, sorry, Nike, my Englishness coming out of me, uh, <laughs> did last year around Colin Kaepernick and, yeah. you know, obviously diversity and their support of women's sport. You know, yeah. on, the, yeah. on the surface, they're this really, really great, yeah. empowering, future-looking company. Yes. But when you actually look at the details and you look at the policy and the structure of the company and what they do, there hasn't really been any material change. And consumers and advisors need to know that. Yeah. So that you can make valid decisions. And, you know, you talk about things like slave labor. Yeah. Absolutely. These companies get tagged for those business practices. And that's really, really important. So it means that we can use data and information to avoid the greenwashers. You know, the people who say they're good and yeah. well, we're not really doing any good. But also to start catching out on those kind of really, really small, you know, seemingly small things. Um, you know, you might go, oh, well, you know, Nike do so much for the world. And yes, you know, they, you know, they, they manufacture some things in Bangladesh for next to nothing. Mm. Some people, that's okay. But for an increasing number of people, that is just no longer acceptable. Yeah, no, 100%. Not- I found out the other day that Converse was owned by Nike. Mm. And I was like, no. Nah. Like, I'm just not going to buy Con- even Converse yeah. anymore. Uh, and look, there, I don't know. What am I wearing now? Bloody something. Aquila. Probably something yeah. fancy. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where I don't know where they make their shoes. But I, um, I'm not the most up-to-date uh, mm-hmm. purchaser. But the things that I do know, I would definitely, definitely like to screen out. I'd like to pivot the conversation just slightly. Um, and I want to talk about how advisors can use this as a, as a client acquisition tool. So um, there are Fox and Hare do this, I think, quite well. They stand for uh, like Glenn. Glenn is gay. Uh, Jess is obviously a, a, a female, and you've you've got these this team that does a lot of promotion of progressive sort of stuff. And again, like not everyone is going to be attracted to that but they're nailing it right mm-hmm. like the, the 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 people that they do speak to they're speaking to really clearly um during this series i, I also uh interviewed hope from a from a, a a financial planning company called simply ethical and um and she just uses that as a client acquisition tool absolutely and so um i want to have a quick chat to you about like what in your okay here's a genuine question out of your marketing activities what are you finding to be really successful that you think you could use as an advisor i mean that's that's a fantastic question um so we we find a couple of things resonate really really well with different types of customers and so you know when we talk about that from acquisition um there are customers who have never previously engaged with financial services, pretty much of any kind. You know, it might have a bank account, but other than that, um, you've got customers who've been burnt by financial services. Um, so it's about gaining trust. Um, and then interestingly, there's also that set of customers still yet to come. You know, this is the big conversation about intergenerational wealth transfer. Um, and so with each of those different markets, I think there are slightly, slightly different conversations to have. And so. The ones who are engaged with financial services and advice, the big question for them is always around performance. If I invest sustainably, am I going to get worse performance? And the simple answer to that is no. There is a huge amount of research to show that it is actually the opposite of that over the long term. More sustainable and responsible investments by their very nature um, provide better long term returns. There's also the argument that in this day and age, in a purely rational sense, looking at future business is a better investment decision and future business just happens to be focusing on sustainability. So you think about that in energy provision. There is a dying section section of the energy market, uh, which is traditional energy, and there's a growing section of the energy market, which is renewables. And so if you're going to invest for the long term for a younger customer, where are you going to start putting money at? Where are you going to start thinking about it? That's a really rational conversation to have. The kind of more emotive conversation to have with those people who have never engaged with financial services is actually about changing the narrative of the conversation. So trying to talk to someone who's never spoken to a financial advisor or never engaged before about what their 
investment horizon is and what their risk profile is, it's me- it's meaningless. <laughs> like they just sit there and go, I-, I don't know, you tell me, dude, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But engaging them on a conversation of going, do you have a kick cut? Mm. You know, what do you think about the environment? What do you think about the prote- protection of the Great Barrier Reef? What do you think about predatory lending? As a narrative and a way into that conversation to engage a completely new client base, yeah. um, I think is really, really powerful. And I think that's why you see Places like the, you know, the ethical advisor co-op and you know, Hope's business, particularly, doing so well yeah. out of having that conversation. And I think the last bit is the recognition that this is really becoming mainstream. So whereas before, their, you know, specific advisors focused on this 100%, and that's, and that's all they do. And I think they will still do incredibly well. But I think what we're already seeing, and we know this from kind of testing with the advisors that we test with, is that. You know, out of a hundred clients that most advisors have, you're going to find somewhere in the range between twenty and fifty of those customers that want to have this conversation. And we know this from testing; um, that is fact. For some of them, it might not even occur to the customer, but when you bring it up, they're like, "Yeah, actually, I do want to have that conversation." And others, it's like, "I'm so glad we're doing this. I've always thought about that." Yeah. And so it's a real opportunity here for advisors to re-engage, change that narrative. Have a better, build a better relationship and learn more about their existing customers, but also go out and acquire completely new ones. Yeah, I can, I can imagine using um, this as a cool little uh, marketing campaign if I wanted to pursue sort of this channel. And and that's a yeah, uh, asking someone what their risk profile is compared to whether they have a keep cup. That's a that's a I mean, that is a marketing bloody uh, campaign yeah. in itself. You know, like. Um, did did a did a financial planner ask for your risk profile or whether you use a keep cut like something like that? Man. Absolutely. So like let's talk about um, and this is a more difficult question. Um, let's talk about so I think about you know if I had my business still and I've got say like a hundred clients that I've been dealing with for let's say five six years, um, and I have uh, operated in one sense with them. Uh, for the last five or six years Um, and that is I haven't had these conversations Mm -hmm. right I haven't Um, now I feel like it's going to be weird if I suddenly start talking about this right A I've taken the focus off them Mm -hmm. right so I'm no longer talking about what makes their life better and what makes their future better and how to you know uh, fund their ideal lifestyle I'm now sort of talking about something else that's external to them. Um, So I think, or maybe I'm overthinking this, but I feel like it would be difficult for me to go back to those 100 people that I speak to on a quasi-regular basis and start talking about something completely different, right? So we've talked about, you know, maybe we can bring up whether it's caged eggs or keep cups and things like that. To, to sort of open a, a conversation. But how would you, Tom, mm. let's Im- put your advisor hat back on. Let's say, because you're, how long were you an advisor for again? Uh, almost 15 years yeah, in, yeah, in the yeah. UK and then seven years here in Australia working in private banking. So, yeah, crazy. Hopefully, man. some experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, like, how would you do this? Like, let, let, let's say I work for an ethical uh, investment company mm-hmm. and you're the advisor. Mm-hmm. And I say, this is a great thing that you're, that let's say 80% of your clients are, are going to be at varying degrees interested in achieving, uh, or sorry, interested in engaging with. Go do it. How would you pick up the phone, write an email, like, how would you take that first step? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a great question. I mean, what I would say to begin with is that any advisor who's scared about having a new conversation is screwed. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> half joking. Um, but, but I would really think about this as that kind of next evolution in the advice process. So, you know, once upon a time, advisors only spoke to their clients about investing. And once upon a time, that was, I'll pick your stocks. Mm. And then that evolved into going, well, we're going to take a more strategic and holistic view about how we manage your wealth for the long term. Then that evolved into insurance, then estate planning, then philanthropy. And so advisors are actually really, really well versed at having a new conversation if they think it adds value to a customer. And I would think about this in exactly the same way. 
And so for me, uh, Clay, you took a really interesting angle of going, before it was talking about you know my customer and their wealth and their goals, and yes. now I'm talking about something external. Yes. I would look at that differently. I would say it's still talking about your customer, their values, their goals, but making sure that it, it happens in a way that doesn't infringe on their personal values. Mm. You know, advisors, th their goal is to learn everything and anything about their customer. As much as they know about their customer, the better. You know, their kids are, their birthdays, where they live, where they go on holiday, what's going on in their lives and their jobs. Knowing something about their kind of sustainable values, I think is just a value add. And if it allows the advisor to adjust their advice, um, then that is, that is a win-win uh, for both client and for advisor. In terms of how you actually approach it, yeah. um, so I would keep it very, very simple. And it's an acknowledgement that this is an increasing, um, uh, it's increasing the level of consciousness in consumers. And so I would put it out that way. So my email would be something along the lines of, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith, um, we, as a really progressive advisor practice, mm -hmm. understand that times change and we understand that now people think about more and more the consciousness of their investments, whether that be from an environmental, a social or a governance perspective. We've taken that on board and we now want to have this conversation with you. If you're interested in it, then fantastic. This is our process. If you're not interested in it, I just wanted to let you know, and that is totally your decision, nothing changes. And I think it's, what a fantastic opportunity. You know, and like I say, I'm fairly confident that most, of, most customers are gonna say yes. That's a really good introduction, I think. And, and I think that's a much better framing as well. So my concerns were, um, I'm taking this to a, to a place that doesn't benefit my clients, you know, like mm -hmm. rather than talking. But I guess realistically, um, if I'm sort of ticking boxes for their emotional, uh, let's call it enjoyment, emotional mm -hmm. benefit uh, of, of knowing that their investments maybe aren't like, let's say they're not heaps into it. Let's say it doesn't make the world a, a better place, but at least uh, reduces harm. I think that's, uh, that's probably a really good angle. And then just writing to them and say, hey, we're keeping up with the times we as a practice we've made a decision to be more conscious of this or or, or we've made the decision to to uh to open these avenues up to our clients awesome if you do still awesome if you don't absolutely um no change yeah no change mate i i definitely do like it um now I, I want to talk very briefly about uh, this product that you uh, are, are bringing to market. So you you launched Goodman's a couple of years ago, and uh, like a lot of fintechs, after a couple of years, they turn around, they go, "Oh yeah, it's the advisors that hold all the funds <laughs> under management." Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. So uh, so you've you've uh, put your uh, fintech hat and your advisor hat on, and you've gone right. How do I uh, take what I've done over here and and pull it across to uh, everything I had known professionally up until I started this. Mm. Makes a lot of sense for you to do it. Um, and you, you're you like literally, I would say, one of the first. I feel like America, like in the States, they realized this earlier, but in Australia, everyone was like, rah, and then, oh, no, 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 actually, yeah, we do have to go, because essentially an, an advisor, and mate, as a well, you're, you're more experienced than me as an advisor, you know you're the gatekeeper, mm. right? And so it makes a lot of sense to, to produce a product that advisors can use. So can you just really quickly walk us through? Yeah, and so, you know, the, the real essence of what the government's advisor portal is about is it's a tool for advisors. So this isn't a, this isn't a product solution, this isn't an investment offering or a managed fund. Right. This is a service that we want to be complementary to the advisor's existing advice process. And we think that's really important because advisors are the ones who know how to give advice. We're mm. not telling them they're doing anything wrong. All we're trying to do is help them engage their customers in this, you know, as we talked about, in this kind of next phase of the advice conversation. So the way that the tool works is, as I, as I mentioned before, it's a it's an engagement tool. So it's a tool that allows the advisor to have a conversation with their customer around sustainable investing. Um, it profiles that customer and gives that kind of consistent and accurate way to define 
what their customers' sustainable or ethical investing parameters are. You know, so, so you would say somewhere between I don't care, I care a little, and I care a lot. Absolutely right. Cool. So what are the priorities? What are the things I absolutely will not accept? Right. Um, and then what are the things that I'm not really fussed about? Cool. And, and like we said, you know, that's going to be vastly different from different customers. Yeah. And, you know, that's a really important thing. The way that the tool then works is um, if you already hold assets for that customer, it will do an auto analysis on the existing portfolios, the existing assets. No. So yeah. if I say I'm with XYZ fund manager, 30% mm -hmm. of my uh, client's portfolio is in that. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm even doing SMAs, mm -hmm. right? So let's say I've got, yeah, 30% in, yeah, I, w I won't pick one, but let's say uh, XYZ, yeah. right? That's going to tell me what's going on. Absolutely. So what it will do is the first, the first thing it will do, it will identify any conflicting investments. Stop it. So it will go, hey, your customer is invested in this portfolio made up of this. Yeah. You know, there's, we're not judging the performance or the portfolio construction. Sure. Yeah. But we're saying these three investments right. do not match that customer's profile. So at an absolute Dang. minimum, yeah. the advisor gets to go, whoa, 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 hang on, client, let's have a conversation about this. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, you've said you don't want to invest in weapons, but right. we have a holding in Intel. Intel makes 3% of their revenue from weapons manufacturer. Wow. How do you feel about that? Yeah. And the customer might turn around and go, you know what? I'm not too fussed. Let's, yeah. leave, let's leave it in. Totally. But, you but know? Halliburton on the other side. <laughs> Absolutely right. But you know what I mean? But for some customers, that 3% of that Intel involvement in weapons, that would be like, you know what? I want that out. But yeah, the wow. At the next opportunity, I would like to um, review removing that from my portfolio and replacing it with something else. Interesting. And I think that's a really important thing for an advisor to be able to do is go, look, we've acknowledged mm. and we've had a conversation and we've made a decision together or mm. I have advised as an advisor on the best course of action based on the information that we now have and that's and i guess like going back to the complexity right so let's say you're going through this process and you've got 100 clients and they all have different things right um the issue is i feel like there is okay do i need to solve it straight away or or, or like am i is it just I'm bringing this to the attention. Realistically, I feel like an advisor is gonna have to do this by themselves before they do it with clients so that they have solutions depending upon what they end up, because the last thing you wanna do is sort of shoot yourself in the foot as an advisor and do this tool, mm -hmm. right? And be like, oh, fuck, like, yep. I've just been caught out. So, so then maybe they're, the, yeah, that's going to have to be, say, like a six to 12 month project on behalf of the advisor to sit down and, and be like, okay, I'm going to put some screens over here. Mm -hmm. And then depending upon what the result is for my client, then I can offer a solution. So I guess, yeah, you're not going to want to do this if, like, with a client if you've never done it before and have no idea. Because the last thing you want to do is sort of get caught out, right? Uh, yeah, may maybe in some ways. I but, I but I think it's about being able to um, continue the conversation. So there's no point in asking a question. You know, so let let's go back to where we were before. You know, so if there is a new directive that says you need to ask a question of from a customer, from yep. Cassia, saying, yep. do you care about sustainable investing or not? Yep. If that customer says yes, the advisor is now under the obligation to understand exactly what that means. And if in the right. example I was using before, the customer said, well, for me, it means I don't want to invest in weapons. Mm. And the advisor goes, oh, okay, great. Yep, move on, write it down. Doesn't want to invest in weapons. <laughs> yeah, yeah blah, 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 move on. Um, <laughs> and then a year later, that customer comes back and goes, hang on, I said I didn't want to invest in any weapons yeah. and I'm invested in Intel. Yeah. What the hell's going on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so even if the advisor doesn't take any action in the first front, it is that acknowledgement piece, which I think is going to be really, really critical yeah. in this kind of next phase of asking that question of going, customer, I acknowledge that you've said no weapons. The way our portfolios are constructed are like this. We have a holding in this company. I want you to be aware of it. Um, yeah, it's then right. up to the advisor you know, to take a couple of routes, make a change to that individual customer and charge them appropriately. Yep. That is up to them and the customer. Yep. Collect data um, and maybe make a wholesale decision to change everything for every client at the next appropriate point. You know, So maybe the next quarterly or six monthly or annually annual portfolio construction meeting going, 
90% of our customer base have said they don't want to be engaged in fossil fuels and weapons. We need to strip these out of our portfolios. Yeah. And that is a real opportunity for your advisors to then go back out to their client base and tell them, hey, imagine that. We listened to you. You said you didn't want this. We have adapted and made a change. By the way, we have selected alternative investments that will not degrade any performance. Yeah, see, I, 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 I appreciate that process more so than sort of going through the tool in real time mm -hmm. with a client and sort of getting caught out. So Absolutely. So perhaps it's like, I, I, I remember like, I don't know if you used to do this, but over the summer holidays, that was kind of when I'd sit down and have a look at my portfolio, how it's performed, if anything's been underperforming and have a like sort of deep diving into what I'd been sort of browsing during the year. Um, it's probably like a good time to sit down uh, figure out you know like the basics of these what, what's called negative screens these Absolutely. are terms yep. I've, I've mm -hmm. since recently yes. learned yes. um so let's say i've got portfolio one two three four five and uh and then i like i can maybe use your tool to mm -hmm. figure out what what investments are actually clashing with negative screen a negative mm -hmm. screen b Absolutely. negative screen c then I at least know, mm -hmm. right? So as an advisor, I've, I've armed with this information. Then I can maybe next year go back to my clients and say, this is something we've been doing as a, a, a firm. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 I think you might or whatever. Like if you're interested, come along. If you're not, that's totally fine. Uh, and, then, and then as those people sort of over the next few months drip in for their annual review, you can sort of take that conversation a bit deeper Absolutely. and say, okay, I think it'd probably be um, really shocking, right, to, to have that conversation with a client who cares, say, a lot. Mm. And then I wonder, would they be grateful that you've gone to the work or would they be upset that you didn't do the work at first? I don't think there was an opportunity to do the work at first. You know, that, that's a really big thing here. It's like this, this, this market and this attitude has evolved so, so quickly yeah. into the mainstream and the public domain um, that I don't think there was any opportunity. Th those clients who would be disappointed, they should have gone to a different advisor that specialized in ethical investing if they cared that much about it. Yep. And I think this is the, 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 the more traditional advisor's opportunity to go, we respect that you might care about it for the first time. We are na now able to deal with this for mm. you. And if you care about it, this is great. We're going to start this journey together. Um, and I think a lot of customers will respect that. Um, you might get one in, you know, one in a thousand, they'll turn around and go, oh, God, I can't believe you didn't talk to me about this 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. But you could have that with anything. You, if you didn't have the insurance conversation with one customer and the worst happened to them, it's the same conversation. And that's always, always going to happen. Nobody can be perfect, but you can take the opportunity with every conversation you have with a customer to extend new options to them, extend new conversations to change the narrative, to change the value equation in the service that you're offering them. And I think that's what this opportunity is. And I think a lot of customers will be really appreciative. Yeah, I guess the more, the more advice has moved over the years away from just plain old investing, mm. right? So it turns into a financial and a lifestyle management, you know, framework. Yeah, this, I feel like this is probably maybe the most clear overlap of what is life and what is money and how do they, um, how do they overlap? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting concept and um, it's great to get your, your view on it. Um, is this tool live now? Uh, it will be live next week, so it's in its last piece of testing with our current advisors. Okay, so, so it'll be, be uh, mid next year. Yeah. Cool. Uh, <laughs> gen genuinely, don't say that. Yeah, don't say that. Next week. <clears throat> to a select few. You <laughs> said <laughs> beta testing. Mate, uh, having lived in tech for the last few years, completely understand. Well, I mean, um, this is the fifth part uh, of the series, so we, we, we've got a couple of weeks up our sleeve before this goes live anyway. Um, so where would advisors go if they want to go check it out? Simply... Goodmansadvisor.com. Goodmansadvisor.com. Dot E R O R. E R. E R A. We took that. That was a big decision. <laughs> big decision. So Mate, I know. It, with e -R. It's crazy because in Australia it's E R, but everywhere else in the world it's 
OR. Well, in the US, it's both. And yeah, in the UK, yeah. it's OR. So, yeah, we didn't know. We just... Yeah, yeah it's, it's a weird one, isn't yeah. it? Okay, but so, so goodmansadvisor.com. <laughs> yep. No AU. No AU.com. Man, thanks so much for coming on. It's really cool to get your opinion on all of this, and I feel like it's been a really good wrap-up. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Cheers, man. Cheers.